So in our current series, we've been looking at the question, what is a perfect relationship with God even supposed to look like? In part five of our series today, we want to bring the focus uh, to the question, what does a perfect relationship with God look like when we give the Holy Spirit complete, complete freedom to move in our lives? Complete freedom. What would that look like? If we gave the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in our lives. Good morning, I'm Pastor Yancey Valdez. Welcome to Columbia Life Church. It is the weekly gathering set apart for people to come and let God breathe life and bring renewal into people's lives through faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. I love having coming a place where we can come and just let God. Come and let God do what he needs to do in our lives today. You know, I was a youth pastor in San Diego, and one of my responsibilities when I was a youth pastor was, um, I was, uh, supposed to lead worship, and so I led worship as one of four worship leaders, and it was, it was always um, an interesting mix because uh, there were all different styles. Everybody has a different style in which they, they, they worship. We had, we had uh, you know, different styles from, you knew this service, if this guy was leading, it was going to be all hymns, or if this guy was leading, it was going to be all Hillsong, or, or whatever, you know, it was just, it was just always a, a, a kind of a different mix. Um, and this particular Sunday, I was scheduled, it was, uh, I was going to do the Sunday evening service. How many of you remember when we used to have a Sunday evening service? And, uh, and so I was getting ready to do worship for the Sunday evening service. We'd get our music together, and that's, that's we didn't even have a pro presenter at the time. Like we, we, we graduated from the overheads. We had a slide projector, and we had slides that we would use for, uh, the, uh, for worship during that time. And I, I don't remember what the worship set was. I just remember we got together we, before church started. We pro, church started at 6, so we probably rehearsed at 4.45, 5 o'clock, just getting things ready. And I remember putting the books together or getting the books together, or my wife was doing that. And, and I remember, I don't remember the set. I, I, I could tell you it probably included 90s music at the time, uh, 90s music. So you might even think Ron Cannoli, uh, you know, back in those days. Uh, Where did the enemies camp? Enemies camp, Hillsong. You know, that kind of stuff. And, and re, you know, really, regardless of the set, the, the set wasn't important. What was important was the heart, you know, getting the heart ready to worship. Everything, just getting the heart ready to worship. Using our voices, using our instruments just to lift Jesus up and, and to create an atmosphere for people to come, come and worship, people to come and enter into the presence of God and let the Spirit move. And, and you know what? You never know when, you come, when you're preparing for worship, you never know... Um, what people might be going through. You don't know how their week went. You don't know, especially if maybe someone that's not even new, to, they're, they're not necessarily a part of your church, they're new, they're visiting. You have a no idea what kind of lifetime they're coming out of, what would have been their, their history or their experience. And you never know what an atmosphere of worship could do in their lives. You just never know. You know, maybe it's their, their, I remember one time I invited a guy to church one time and uh, I worked with him. I remember the first time I was, I was shocked he actually came to church. And the first words out of his mouth were, well, the church walls didn't fall down. You know, those, that's, he, was just, he was just glad that the church walls didn't fall down when he walked into the church. I was like, praise the Lord. I said, no, they're not going to fall down. We all, we all put on our jeans just like, the, just like everybody else does, one leg at a time. We're all normal around here. And, and so I remember, you know, you never know. You really can never know what an atmosphere of worship can do to impact someone's life. And especially when you think about, you know, we, we generally connect worship with music, and that's a part of it. I mean, we worship in other ways, but when we worship on Sunday morning corporately, we use music, we use songs so that we can all praise God corporately and together. You know, we use, we, and we give the spirit room to do that. And, you know, music, I was thinking about this today because music is such an, an amazing thing. I actually got called into, uh, I actually got my degree in music before I was actually called in, in ministry because I love music. I, I loved, I, I grew up, I remember even before going to kindergarten, I remember watching uh, 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 cartoons, and I could go to the piano, and I could, I, 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 could, I could start playing the cartoon melodies or stuff that were right on the piano, just one finger at a time. And so I had a love, no, I, was just, I just had a love for music. Um, but the other part of it is that music is, is such an amazing thing, because when you think about it, in an otherwise physical and mundane world, you know, you take, you take, a, you take a string, you, you put some tension on it, and if you pluck it, it'll make a pitch. It'll make some kind of sound. If you cut that string in half, it'll be an octave. It'll be the same sound, but an octave higher. And, and just the physical attributes that God had put in this creative world of ours to create a sound. We, you know, we got seven notes in, in, a, in a major scale or 12 notes in a chromatic scale. And there's just, 
things that we can, we can listen to that we say, boy, that's, that's beautiful, that's art. You can, you can take these 12 notes, you can put them in a certain arrangement, and it's like, whoa, that's beautiful. And the thing with, with music is, is with all these notes and, 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 and pitches, it produces an area of expression for us. Music produces an area of expression for us that evokes emotion. It evokes emotion, it evokes longing, it, and it transcends our thought, it transcends our language, and it literally has the power to reach the very depths of our soul. Mm-hmm. That's what music does. It, it can literally reach places that thoughts and words can't. You know how, how I, I can tell you there's things that are communicated that are not in English just when I hold my wife's hand. There's a sense of connection. You know, and so there, there's something about that. And, and it's, what's wild is that we've been created in the image of God. God, God made us in his image. We're supposed to be his image bearers here on earth. And so it's a, it's a privilege to think that in worship, it's a privilege to think that in worship, we get the privilege to bring our praise before him. We get the privilege to bring our praise before him. And we get to have an audience with the king of kings. We get the opportunity to touch his heart through praise and worship. Beyond the song, like I said, it wasn't, the importance wasn't in that, in that service. It wasn't the song said. It was, it was the heart to worship. It was the heart to, to have the privilege that, that God is literally opening his heart to us, that we can come and, and touch his heart. And I've got to tell you that, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be good to touch God's heart. <laughs> you don't have to, just telling God thank you and worshiping him and and, it's, and it's, it's in worship that we get to be like King David was, the, the shepherd boy David. He was the man that played his heart before his king, before King Saul. And, and David was also known as the man that was after God's own heart. Worship seemed to open the doors for David. In worship, we get to be like David. And you never know, you never know how worship's going to touch a person's heart because you have no idea where they've been, where they've come from. Yet, what, yet when we create an atmosphere where God can make himself known, when people come and he says, I don't know what you guys sang, I don't know what you preached on, all I know is that I met God. Yep. That God was in this place. You don't have to send me a, a follow-up thank you note or, or, or visitor card. I know I'm going to be back next week because I found God here. <laughs> you know, when, when, when people know that we serve a God who makes himself known, and that he welcomes everybody. It's an amazing thing, because you can't manufacture that. Just an idea, God, I want you to be present. We want you to be present here. You never know. And I remember that Sunday evening, we were worshiping God, and we were doing it. Don't get me wrong, we're a spirit-filled church. We love the presence of God. And I remember playing, praying that day, and I remember that as, as we were praying, we were praying, and then we started playing, we started entering into worship. Something was different that night. I started praying and, or started playing and you could just tell the Spirit of God was just falling on that place. There's songs we, there wasn't like a new song that said this is the it song or, we were just, we were just worshiping. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord just started falling. I, I, I could barely play the piano and tears started streaming from my, I couldn't even tell you why. You know, we were praying for God's anointing to do our jobs, to do our jobs as best we could, but you could tell something was different, that the the glory began to fall, because when the glory falls, you can't do nothing. And you could just see God doing things, and we we kept going, and I know it was God that kept helping us. And as we're we're playing, I mean, it's a good thing I had my songbook out there, because because it was was just like there was the freedom, just God wanted to be worshipped that day. That evening, God just wanted, God liked it, liked what was happening so much, I guess. I don't, I can't tell you when we started or when we stopped. All I can tell you is, is as we were worshiping, people were, people were coming to a God because they felt so welcome to come. The, the altars just started coming. There was no altar call. Wow. But people just felt they needed to get out of their seats and come forward. And they started just praising God. They got on their knees, they started praising God. There was weeping, there was, there was something going on that, that we didn't plan for. There was something that was out of order, but not out of order. It wasn't going to our order of service, but the Holy Spirit was taking control of the service, and, and, and the Holy Spirit was moving. And 
I remember seeing people coming to the altar. They were finding a place to worship and they were, they were coming and letting God. They were just coming and letting God. And in that moment, as they were coming and letting God, it, it, you know, I didn't realize, you know, you didn't realize the, maybe the strife that people were coming out of. You didn't realize maybe the Egypt that people were coming out of. The pain or the, whatever, because you had no idea where pe- what people were coming out of. All I knew is that they were coming to the altar, they were finding a place, place to, to be with God, and what I did see was I saw things that, I saw, I saw some reconciliation happening. I, I, saw, I saw anger and bitterness and unforgiveness tur- and turn into tears and hugs and new beginnings. I mean, you, you, could, see, you could see in that moment, um, you know, I, di- I didn't realize how some of the things that were going on between families some of the things that were going on in marriages, some of the things that were going on relationally, or just, just God was just literally taking a scrub brush and just cleaning things out. And, and ministry was happening during worship. I mean, we're, just, we're just trying to touch the heart of God. We're just worshiping God. We're just, we're just there trying to worship God. And, and when the Holy Spirit fell like that, it changed everything. I don't even think pastor preached that day. I think the Holy Spirit preached that day. And, and, and we all went out differently than the way we came in. We didn't leave that place the same way we walked in. And it changed everything. What, is, what, is, what does it look like when we give the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in our lives? It changes everything. We would never worship the same way. We, we, we weren't coming to church expecting things to happen the way they used to happen. The level of expectation for God showing up changed dramatically. We weren't just going to go through the motions anymore once God showed up. He made himself so big, so known, it, it changed the way we prepared for service. It, it, I mean, it's like a, a big outpour comes and you realize, man, uh, it's, it's a big outpour is happening on your house and you sh- shoot, man, I need to clean out the rain gutters because they didn't work last time or I need to, I need to make sure that I, I got my drains where things are draining down the driveway or whatever. I just got to make sure I got a place where the water can go. And you just start thinking because you knew people, you knew people that were at the... I know, I know what happened to me, but can you imagine the person that was there at the altar saying, they're going out during the week, you need to come to church on Sunday because guess what? I found God. They were so filled, you couldn't, you couldn't not contain that good news. You have no idea what God did for me last Sunday. It changed everything. You didn't have to try to share. You couldn't help but share. You were going to burst if you didn't share what God had done in your life. It's like you wanted the world to know. You, knew, you, you, you could look at, and you could look at hurting people's lives and you could say, I, I have something that can, that can, that can help you. <laughs> you're not trying to, to throw your faith on somebody. You're just, you're just trying to compassionately help someone. It's like you're saying, I, I, think, I, think, I think I know someone that can help you. Amen. And it just changes the way. It changes the way you think about things. In the series, we've been trying to emphasize the... Got to have a Kleenex, too. It's just the way it works in church, Right? You know, in this series, we've been trying to emphasize the perfect relationship with God um, is really the kind of relationship that Jesus, the Son of God, had with his Father. I'm trying to re-emphasize that. If you were to look at who had, who had the ultimate relationship with God the Father was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He, his relationship with the Father truly modeled for us the fullness of life. We're all called. We're all created to live in, in really revealing humanity in relationship with God, in the glory God intended. Just like Jesus. You've been in Galatians 2.20, where Paul was speaking to the Galatian church. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, his relationship was awesome. He loved his relationship with, with, with his father. I mean, we, a lot of us can say, I love God, I know, love God, uh, I know God loves me, but the deeper question is, do you love that relationship you have with the Father? Yes. 
Do you love, do you love that relationship you have with him? You see, his relationship, Jesus' relationship with his father, um, it, it was not only something that he loved, but it, it also points, his relationship points to a divine plan for humanity that would, enable, that would enable all who would put their faith and their trust in Jesus to also experience life in relationship with his father. And it's a life filled with world-impacting potential. This relationship we have with God through Christ, it can change everything. It can change your marriage. It can change your family. It can change your household. It can change the world. And when we give the, the Holy Spirit freedom to move in our life, complete freedom to move in our lives, I'm going to tell you, it's crazy. It's crazy. When you give the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in your life, you create the conditions for God to show up in big ways. Big ways. Big ways. Everybody say big ways. Big ways. I guess say it like this. Big. Big ways. Big ways. Shows up in big ways. And I want to take you to Acts chapter 10 today. This is one of my favorite chapters. There's so much in here. I could probably preach a whole series just on this chapter, but I love revisiting this chapter for me because this is probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible because there's so many lessons in here. But one of the things I wanted to highlight, you know, in, in answering our questions today is that this, this really here is the story, it begins with the story really of, of two men in this chapter. There's two men in this chapter, and, and they're both on a spiritual journey. One of them is a veteran. One of them is a, an, a, he's a seasoned veteran in the spiritual journey. He is an apostle. It's the apostle Peter. I mean, he, he followed Jesus for years up to this point. He, he stumbled to follow Jesus. He, he was quite, quite, Quite the person that liked to put his foot in his mouth. He would say things and then have to backtrack. He, he blew it a few times. He denied Jesus three times, but he's also encountered Jesus' forgiveness and also the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on his life. Well, he was timid at one point. At another point, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave one of the first sermons to the church when the church was born and literally thousands came to the Lord as a result of the words that the Holy Spirit was putting in his mouth to share. The Spirit of the Lord was upon his life. And then there's another man that this, this chapter talks about. He's also on a spiritual journey, but he's a beginner. He's on the front end of his spiritual journey, and his name is Cornelius. So when you think of Cornelius, think of, think of like a cornet. Think of, it literally comes from the Latin to mean like a trumpet. So there's, there's a trumpet guy, even though I don't know if he plays trumpet, but his name's Cornelius, and he is, he's an Italian trumpet player. He's a, he's in the, he's a soldier. And I, I want to share with you these first two verses. I'm going to highlight the story as we go through this a little bit. But if you look at the first couple of verses here, in um, Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, it says that in Caesarea, I'm just, let me even, well, let me read it. I'll come back. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was, de he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household, and he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Now, Caesarea, where he lived, it was on the coast of, of the Holy Land, um, northern coast of the Holy Land, uh, boarded the Mediterranean Sea, and it was, think of Caesarea like uh, Los Angeles. I, I remember in 1984 when the Olympics came to Los Angeles, and it was, it was just, it, it's just a massive city, uh, a coastal city. And this is what Caesarea was. If you were going to visit the, visit the Holy Land, it was just a place, it was, it was like an international hub. This is where you landed if you wanted to go to visit the Holy Land. It was, you'd go to Caesarea, and and so Cornelius, he lived here. He, he lived here. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. And it says that he was devout. Even though he was a beginner, he was devout. He was a God-fearing man. And, and so was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and he prayed regularly to God. This is how the Bible describes him. It says if you're going to talk about this beginner, his name was Cornelius, even though he's not, he, he's not, he's not a Jew, he's doesn't know Christ yet, he knows about the God of the Jews. He's a God-fearing man. Now, when I think about this man who's, who's God-fearing and he fears the God of the Jews, I mean, he's, he's obviously, he's, he's been living in the Holy Land for a while, so he's seen a lot of Jewish people go celebrate Passover. And we know that Passover is the celebration of, of when God delivered his people from Egypt. So I can only imagine, you know, when he's thinking about that, man, their God delivered their people out of slavery, oppression, out of Egypt. Egypt was like, you know, 2,000 years before. I mean, it, it was the predominant nation upon the face of the earth. 
if certainly if their God could deliver them from Egypt, what, they could, what could they do to us in Rome? I think it's probably a wise thing that we fear the God of the Jewish people. Not only deliver from Egypt, at that point, he also delivered them from Babylon. They, they had already come out from exile. Not only did he do it one time, he did it twice. For some reason, this people, they don't die. They've tried to eradicate them. They don't die. He was a God-fearing man. He recognized the God whom the Jews served. And it says he was devout. He was devoted. I got to tell you something. I, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I always knew Jesus was my Savior. I, I gave my heart to Christ uh, when I was in kindergarten. So I, I grew up in a Christian home. I always knew Christ. I always felt like if I died, I knew I was going to heaven. But I also knew in my spiritual journey that there came a, there, there came a point in my spiritual journey from the time I was a beginner to learning how to walk with Christ, that I needed to make the God of my parents my God. That, that there came a point where I needed to not just kind of be in the family of God, I needed to devote my life to him. That, that there was a part of me, no matter what vocation God would call me to do, whether it was a musician or whatever, or, or however God, job God would eventually call me to, uh, ended up in ministry, but there, w there was a point where I, before I ever got into ministry, I devoted my heart to God. And, 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 and there's something different when you do It's kind of like, I remember we meeting my wife, and I said, oh, I'd like to get to know her. And I got a chance to know her. I knew I was going to marry her. But then I also needed to devote myself to her and put every other woman on notice. I'm not available anymore. There's only one person for me and I'm going to spend the rest of my lifetime with her. Does that make sense? And there, there comes a place where I says, you know what, there's no other God in my life. There's one God in my life. And, and, I, and I realized when I began to devote myself to God, things started to change. There was, there, there was, there was, like, there was like, God, and it, 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 it's just, there was just something, something was released from God into my life that helped me in this journey. And, and Cornelius, he, he devoted his heart to God. He was God-fearing. And he gave generously to the poor. He prayed regularly. I mean, these are actions that made his life bigger than himself. Whenever you pray and you start praying and interceding for others, you're, you're getting out of, we're, we're getting out of our own self-centered circle. Once we start praying and we start coming out of our own comfort zone and we start praying for somebody, that begins a transformation in our lives where we begin to make our life matter in the world. We begin to... Uh, make our lives greater than ourselves whenever we begin to intercede and we start praying for others. It's, it's not about our lives. It's about Christ living in us. It's not my life that needs to be seen. It's about Christ living in us. Not only did he pray, but he also gave generously to the other. He literally tried to make a tangible impact in other people's lives. God recognized that. There were literally conditions in his life that created an atmosphere to God to show, for God to show up in big ways. For God to show up in big ways. This man was on a spiritual journey, and God knew it. It says, as we go on here, it said that, that, that one afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision, and when he saw the angel of God coming toward him, Cornelius, the angel said, Cornelius stared at him in terror, because he never had an encounter like this at all. An angel shows up, and he's looking at him in terror, and, and, and he's like, what is it? What is it, sir? The angel, and the, he asked the angel, and the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Wow. My life was seen by God. My life was known. Can you imagine that? God comes, shows up, and he, and, he, and he says, Lauren, or, or, you know, or he says, Stephanie, or he says, Virgil, or, or whatever, and you're like, you know my name? You know my name? You know who I am? That's pretty wild to think. That God knows your name. And that, that he would show up and, and actually call you by name. Say, I, I know you. I created you. I named you. You know, that's, that's a wild thought. And he, he's freaking out in terror because he's never had this kind of spiritual experience. All he, he's been doing stuff and all of a sudden God's showing up in a big way. He was trying to honor God. I'm not saying everything was perfect about his life. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't a full-out Jew, he, and he didn't know Christ yet, but, but 
there were conditions in his life. He was, he was trying to figure out who God was as best he could where he was at. He couldn't do anything more to give God room in his life than what he already knew and what he was trying to do. And God showed up in a big way. And it scared the bejeebies out of him. And he, he shows up and, and, and he tells him, he says, listen, I want you to go to, send some men to Joppa, summon this, this seasoned veteran. His name is Simon Peter. He's staying, at, he's staying uh, on, on the seashore in Joppa. And as soon as, as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants, a devout soldier, another devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and he sent them off to Joppa. And so he sends them off to Joppa, which is south of Caesarea. Peter's there. He's on the roof. He's praying. Now you've got to remember Peter. He's a seasoned veteran, but he's still coming out of Judaism. He knows Christ, but there's still some Jewish dynamics in his life. You know, that, now, spirituality for a Jewish person is that, is that if, if you're a Jewish person, the way they, they, way they connected with God or understood their connection with God is that there's a God who commands and there's a God who performs the command. It's called a mitzvah. There's this bond called a mitzvah. And so it creates a bond between the one who commands and the one who performs the command. And so that's why there's, the, the religion was based on the law. You do this, you get that. You, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. And so it was always based on, this, on these commandments. And so Peter's thinking, I grew up with these laws. This is how I understood God growing up. And I'm trying to figure out what that means now that Jesus died on the cross for me and what that all means. And so the Lord, the Lord reveals to Peter this big canopy coming down with unclean animals, according to, to, to Scripture. He says, kill them and eat them. Peter says, I've never done that. I don't want to break that law. That, if I broke that law, that would, that would break my bond between, you, between us. He says, that's not, that, that's not how we connect anymore. There's a new bond in which we connect, and his name is Jesus Christ. He died for all of your sins. He fulfilled the law so that we could die to sin and rise to new life in Christ, to have a brand new relationship with God, a brand new relationship with God. The way it's supposed to look is, I have been crucified with Christ. Christ now lives in me. He now lives in me. And so Peter's trying to figure this out in his journey. He's a, he's a seasoned vet. Lord tells him, you know, don't, don't look at something unclean, uh, something unclean or something I've given you and call it unclean. And, and he says, what I've cleaned, I've made clean. And so he knows that these men are coming, um, to visit Peter, Peter, God tells Peter to go with these men to go see Cornelius. And so Peter goes, to, goes with these men to Cornelius. And we pick up the story um, in verse 24. It says, They arrived in Caesarea the following day, and Cornelius was, was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. He already had basically a, a room already ready to go. He had everybody there. He knew Peter was coming. He was, I mean, talk about giving the Holy Spirit freedom to move in his life. He knew God told him to send his men to go, go find Peter. He knew Peter was going to come. Even before Peter was coming, even before his men, after his men left, he begins four days of getting ready for this moment. He's, he's making room for something to happen. He, this angel showed up and scared the, the bejeebies out of him. And he knew this was a precursor of something else even greater to come. You see, when God shows up, we need to be good stewards of when God shows up because it's, it's just the beginning of even something greater to come. Right. We have to believe that. Amen. The angel shows up in his life and says, oh shoot, he, he told me to do this. I've just, I've, just put the, I've just taken the ball. I passed the ball to these guys. Now I need to get ready. You need to get ready for a new baby. <laughs> Obviously, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't ignore the fact that God wants to do something mighty in your life. Now, you can take that as a prophetic word or not, but God just wants to do something big in your life. I believe he does it. Whatever you've experienced in your journey with God, there are greater things to come. There are greater things to come. There are greater things to come. And so he begins preparing. He's getting ready. He's getting ready for something big to come. And so he's waiting for them with close friends. As Peter entered his, his home, Cornelius, he didn't know what to do. He fell at his feet and he began worshiping. What else am I supposed to do? But Peter pulled him up and said, listen, stand up. I'm a human being just like you are. So they talked together inside and, and where many of the others were assembled. And then verse 28 says that Peter told them, you know, it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home. 
like this and to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection. I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, now, I tell, now, now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa, summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. He couldn't be any more ready. He got everything ready. His life, he was so open to what God wanted to do. Even if an angel showed up and it scared the heck out of him. But then he, he, he had enough presence of mind to be able to understand what the angel was talking to him, to be able to perform and do what the angel had told him to do. And he did, but he knew, he knew that that encounter, he didn't arrive. He knew it was just the beginning of, a, of an adventure to come. He knew something greater was coming. And he prepared for it. He got his heart ready. Peter says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. What good news. What good news for, for Cornelius. He's been searching for God for all his life. He's, he's done the best he could as a beginner. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. That's good news. He says, you know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism? And as you know, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, because God was with him. And the scripture says that we apostles, we were witnesses of all that he did throughout Jerusalem. We are seasoned veterans now. We, we, we're still learning, but we, we, we're witnesses of what happened to Jesus. And they put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. This is our story. This is our testimony, and we're sticking to it. He died, but God raised him back up to life again. Then God allowed him to appear, to appear not, to, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. We had a special kind of communion with him after his resurrection. And he ordered us to preach, to preach everywhere, and to testify that Jesus is the one, the only one. Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Now think about everything that happened up to this moment. He's a devout man. He's, he's a soldier in the Italian regiment. He's God-fearing. He regularly prays to God. He, he tries to live out his faith. He tries to make an impact in the world. He tries doing what he thinks he's supposed to be doing to have a relationship with God as best he can. Not saying he got, had it all right, but as best as he can, he's trying to figure out who God is. He's seeking God shows up as an angel. He does what the angel tells him. He's, he's literally trying to order his life for this moment. He, he prepared for the moment for Peter to arrive. And now as they're sitting, and, he, and he, he's at the top of his, of his readiness, his heart is open, and now the word of God, the good news of Jesus Christ is now being implanted in his life. He's hearing something he's never heard before. For the very first time, we Christians, we're, we live in a post-Christian modern society and we, it's like, oh, I've heard the gospel a million of times, but he's hearing it for the very first time. I've struggled with trying to forgive myself for years. Can you imagine that for Cornelius or dealing with forgiveness or bitterness or anger? But he was open to God. And this is while the message was being preached, 
said, it said, even as Peter, verse 40, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. Wow. As the message is being preached, the Holy Spirit is falling. Just imagine, just close your eyes and just think of that moment. Imagine that, that room. The word is being preached and at the same time, the Holy Spirit is falling. And as the word is being preached, as the word, as, as the breath of God is being preached and being implanted in their heart, the Holy Spirit is falling and filling their being. And they're receiving the forgiveness that the message promises. They're, 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 they're receiving a justification, not because they did it all right, but because Jesus did it all right. They're moving from an understanding as I've never been right with God. I don't, I don't know how to get right with God. But as the message is being preached, they're moving to a place where I guess I am right with God. Because he sent his son to die for me. I'm right with God not because of every wrong thing or every right thing. I've been, I, I, I'm right with God because of what Jesus has done. And that message began to change their lives. All of a sudden, there, there, there was a freedom they began, they began experiencing. But, the, but, but I'm looking at this in the context, Cornelius was so, so liberating, so free to allow the Holy Spirit to move in his life. It was like a converging of things that began to happen. I'm just seeking God, trying to figure him out, and guess what? God shows up in my life. And as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as they were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. What? That's scandalous. It's poured out on non-Jewish people like you and me. I don't know if you're Jewish, but if you're not. <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. It was like they were being filled up like a balloon. They had to let the air out. They had to let the praise come back to God in a way that was, that was like music. It was beyond thought. It was beyond language. It was like a beautiful music that began to touch the heart of God. Cornelius had been trying for, uh, I don't know how many years, but for some time, Cornelius had been trying, the heart, trying to touch the heart of God. On this day, he was able to, in a way that he's never experienced before. Not because of his own strength or power, but because of God's grace upon his life. He literally gave the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in his life. And a big thing happened that day. This was the first instance in the Bible where we see Gentiles, people like you and me, manifest that we're part of God's family. This, this, this changes everything about to the trajectory of the church. Everything that was happening in Acts chapter 2 is, is, is mostly among the Jewish crowd. Jewish people coming to, coming to Pentecost, coming from all over the world, and, and God impacting a Jewish, a Jewish audience. But in this moment, the Gentiles... It was meant for Gentiles as well. The cor he was becoming the cornerstone in that moment where Jew and Gentile would now come together as his church. Lord. And Peter asked, can anyone object to them being now baptized, being part of our family, being baptized in water, now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? I mean, that's my testimony. I was actually baptized in the Holy Spirit before I was baptized in water. He just came upon my life. I was just trying to serve him, figure out how to do that. And the Holy Spirit fell. I didn't even know what was happening to me. I just knew I needed to praise God. And something started coming out of my being. And so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay for several days. I would too. I'm like, wow. Wow. What an amazing God we serve. Amazing God we serve. When we give the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in our lives, we create the conditions for God to show up in a big way. How many of you would love to see God show up in big ways? How, ma how many of you believe that we live in a world that we need God to show up in big ways? I don't know how we can do it without the Holy Spirit. I don't know how we can do it without the preaching of God's word and without the falling of the Holy Spirit. We need both. We need the preaching of God. We need the worship. We need to create the conditions for, for, for God for, for people to figure out how do we touch God's heart? How can God touch our heart? We need to create an atmosphere for that to happen because, you know, if we were trying to grow a cactus, we can't do it in Alaska. We need, we need the right conditions for God to work 
And so we've we got to continue to, to, to seek God. We need the worship, we need the preaching of God's word, and we need the Holy Spirit to fall upon us so that people can come and let God. People can come and let God. Here's, here's my takeaway for you today. Ask the Lord this week. Ask the Lord for the grace to give the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in your life. God, give me the grace. I may not know what that looks like for my life, Lord, but I need the grace for the Holy Spirit to move, to have complete freedom in my life. I want you to show up. It's my desire to show up in a big way in my marriage, in the lives of my kids, in my family, in my workplace, wherever you would call me, Lord. I need, I need the grace to give you freedom because sometimes we won't give the Lord freedom if we don't trust him. The way, he, the way we'll give him freedom is, we, is that we trust him, Lord. I need the grace to trust you. Honestly, Lord, I want to be able to trust you with every aspect of my life. Give me the grace to trust you with every aspect of my life. Give, I, I, I want to give your Holy Spirit the freedom to give me the words, to, give me the, to direct me in the actions. Have the freedom, Lord, in my life. I'm going to encourage you today. Today, it starts today, and we're gonna, I'm going to pray for, for you, for, for the Holy Spirit to come to you in a greater measure today as we're praying for that. We're getting ready to close the service. But let me, let me direct you in this. Maybe you're on the front. Maybe you're like Cornelius. You're on the front end of this journey. Maybe you're listening to this message and you're at the front, of this journey, front end of your journey. Let me ask you this. You've you got to first ask yourself this question for yourself is, is, do you know Jesus? When did you ask him to come into your life? Do you know if you're born again? Because it starts there. It starts there. Has, have, has you, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Do you know that if you, if you were to die today that you're going to heaven? Because it starts there. It starts in believing that he is the one that God the Father sent to die for our sins, to pay, the, to settle the debt of our sin, and that he was raised from the dead to give us a brand new life. God, it is through the message of Jesus Christ that God invites us out of trying to survive in this world in our own strength and understanding and to enter into a re- personal relationship with God that will last forever. It's a relationship that starts now and it's a relationship that lasts forever. And if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I want to invite you to give your heart to Jesus today because it starts here first. But then after we do that, we can pray for the Holy Spirit to come and fill you into overflowing because when you invite Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit's going to come into your heart and he's going to take residence and we're going to start a brand new journey. But then after that, Jesus begins to come and fills you until you're overflowing. Overflowing. Let's start there. Let's pray. I want you to pray this prayer. If you have not, if you don't know if you've been born again, you need to make a decision or you just want to be sure uh, that you're in right, right relationship with God. Let's just say this prayer together. Let's lay this foundation together. Let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins because I know I've blown it so many times. I ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive me. I believe that you died for me to pay the price for my sins and that you were raised from the dead to give me a brand new life. Come into my heart, come into my life, and fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer today and you meant it, you begin a brand, you begin a brand new life today. Spirit is in your heart right now. Happy birthday. It's a brand new day today for you. Now, this is just the beginning because as we continue in this journey, God himself comes. If you haven't been baptized in water, you need to get baptized in water. It's the next thing to do. But then Jesus is even here right now because he wants to take the spirit that's already been deposited in you and he wants to fill you until you're overflowing. And the way that works is I want to encourage you that, that first of all, can I encourage you with something that God is present and he welcomes all who comes. You don't need to be scared when the spirit comes and fills us. Because it's not something that happens to you. It's the Lord Jesus himself coming to you personally. He's the one that baptizes, not me. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and baptizes. and It's Jesus who comes and baptizes and fills with the Holy Spirit. And if there's something I want you to know about my God is that he's here and he welcomes all who come. You may not feel like, like you're worthy at times, but God, I got here to tell you that the promise of the Holy Spirit is for all who would put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. It's for all of you. It's, it's the promises for us and, and for our children. Jesus said in John 7, on the, on the last day, the climax of, of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who, 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 is, uh, who is thirsty may come and drink for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. 
It's a promise for you. It's a promise for of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says in John 6, 37, all those that the Father gives will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not drive away. You're welcome. You're welcome, he says. You're welcome to come. And he's not going to give you something that, that, that's not from him. He's the one who promises. And he says, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open to you. He knows how to give the Holy Spirit to those who come for him. And so it's, 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 it's nothing to be afraid of. We come to him. And, and so this morning, I want to encourage you this morning. If you, if you believe, here's the thing, if you believe that we need God to show up in a big way in our world today, it starts with us. It starts with God showing up in a big way in our lives. So I'm going to just ask you to bow your heads with me today. And if that's you, you know, in your, own, in your own moment right here this morning, just lift your heart to God. Lift your heart to God. Say, God, I, I want you to show up in a big way. I want, give me the grace, Lord God. Give me the grace hmm. to give you complete freedom, to give the Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in my life. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for those that are genuinely seeking that prayer. They, they want you to show up in a big way, Lord. They want uh, the grace to be able to trust you, to be, to be able to give your Holy Spirit complete freedom to move in their lives. Lord, I pray that right now, Lord, would you come and fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them to overflowing, Lord God. Fill them, Lord God. Fill them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Now, here's what I want to encourage you. I'm, I'm, I'm praying in the Spirit, as I'm, as I'm in the Spirit, I'm laying my hands upon you today. Because I know in the scripture that when, when they laid hands upon, uh, Paul laid hands upon his, the disciples, Lord, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So just in this moment, in, in, by the Spirit, oh, believe that Jesus, by faith, is filling you right now. He's filling you with joy. He's filling you with peace, peace of mind, peace of heart. And he's given you a water source to derive life from right now, even in Jesus' name. And I want to encourage you right now, as he's doing that, he's here and you're in a safe place, can I encourage you to do, you need to expect God to give you a language, a way to praise him. Um, if anything else, when we devote our hearts to Christ, we, we become people of praise. We become people that, that learn how to praise God, worship God. Um, like Cornelius, um, God uses our prayer language to pray. He uses our prayer language to intercede for others. And so just in this moment, I just want to take a, a moment here. Can I encourage you just to begin praising God as you know how to do? Start with, just, just, just praise God. Take a moment to thank him. Use your voice. Thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Use the, the air in your lungs to give praise, to offer the sacrifice of praise to our God. Lord, thank you for your breath, Lord God. Thank you for filling my being. Thank you for causing my heart to pump and the blood to flow, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your deliverance from anger, bitterness, Lord God, deception, Lord God. Thank you for delivering, from my, delivering me from my Egypt, Lord God, as I give you praise today. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you today, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that this week, Lord God, that as we, 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 we learn to praise you, as we continue to go deeper in our worship and praise to you, Lord God, I pray there would be moments, maybe there would be moments where we're, we're driving down the street, we have to pull over because the Spirit of God is falling in ways we can't even imagine, Lord God. That you'd open divine appointments, divine, divine ordained appointments, Lord God, to use what you're doing in our lives to share with others. Not because we feel like we have to, it's like something, but, but create the circumstances where we feel like it's, just, it's something we have to do. Like, or something we, we feel compelled to do because your spirit is leading, Lord God. Not out of compulsion, Lord God, just out of joy. I pray joy and peace would fill my brother and sister today until they are overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord God. 